Um, and I just wanted to start out by showing you a little bit, we're going to be talking about removal and how you make that decision to, um, to take a child out of their biological home. And I wanted to start by just showing a little footage. Um, Jennifer and the department was kind enough to let um, uh, myself and a videographer uh, do some ride-alongs last year. So we're going to see a little bit of um, footage from uh, what was actually like. Rishi's got it. This is where the kids stay. We do our best to get them placed within four hours. We do our utmost best to get them out into foster care or relative care. But sometimes they have to wait here a little bit longer. So we try to make it as comfortable as possible with the food. We have um, vouchers for McDonald's. I remember interviewing a young mother in jail. And I was, you know, she was so hostile to me when I took her child. I was really bracing myself for this visit. And she broke down and cried. And she said to me, Jennifer, you did the best thing for me, you did the best thing for me by taking my kids. I would have never stopped using drugs. You saved my life. And I was like, wow. My feeling is if I save one child from harm, maybe they'll grow up in a healthy, happy environment, and maybe that will stop the generational abuse. And maybe that child will be good to its child, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I've actually managed regional offices, and it's actually a different character of people who work night versus day. Um, I think our nighttime workers tend to be a little tougher. Good evening. Um, I'm a social worker with Children's Services. We're going to the city of Pacoima, uh, the Foothill Division, LAPD. We have a an 18-year-old female who has allegedly been uh, impregnated by her stepfather. At risk is the 10-year-old sibling who also resides in the home. Allegedly, the mother is aware of the consensual relationship between the 18-year-old and the stepfather and has uh, allowed the uh, stepfather to continue to reside in the home. How long had, had, have you had a relationship with him? que no le deseo a nadie que a nadie le vaya a pasar porque a mí me pasó y es muy triste muy duro se siente uno decepcionado from my understanding um they were going to get the horse they were going to work with the papers and she was going to move out and we were going to move out you and Arteria yeah well he helped me get my school you know and try to get a small career and see what I would do after that Mija, that is so wrong on so many levels. So wrong. Really. Mi hija la grande salió embarazada de mi esposo. Y But this family needs this counseling. Mom has a medical condition. Um, Gabriela just had a, she probably had a panic attack, they say it was a heart attack. So my goal, and, and what I always do is I try to be a leader with my staff wherever I'm at and say, as long as we can protect the children. We can't always save the family. The mother, the father, we can't make them not use drugs and get a job and be fitting into society, but if we can save that child. That's what we got. Um, so on that, I mean, this is really tough. And you know, um, that's, that's what you're facing all the time. And you know, we spent two nights with Elba and, and, and <coughs> But we got we got issues out there, and we need to we need to start solving them. So that's why we've got two of the best minds on this issue right here, right now. So so Jennifer, maybe you could uh, talk us through what this all is. Okay. Thank you very much for having uh, me come out. I'm actually quite humbled to be speaking in front of Dr. Sanders because I consider him one of the best child welfare experts in the nation and he was our director and we keep begging him to come back but I'm sure he's got better things to do at Casey. Um, so um, 
I just wanted to let you know, first I always like to know with an audience, what are you all studying to be? So just roughly, are you going to be social workers, journalists, reporters, sort of, what, just scream at anything. Journalists. Journalists. Social workers. Social workers. Public policy. How interesting. You want lawyer. <laughs> what was that? Lawyer. A lawyer, okay, good, because all of this stuff actually could fit into child welfare if you think about it. So um, we had the opportunity, it was great for them to come out, we had had permission. And what you saw, because I heard cause some of you kind of side with that, that's almost, I hate to say, an everyday thing, but I actually brought some photos out, because I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the Welcome from the Institution Code. Were you guys able <coughs> to um, look at the fact sheet? Were able? Did you have any questions at all about the fact sheet? You do know LA County Children's Services is the largest child welfare agency in the world. We service about 35,000 children daily, and we get um, a, roughly about 14,000 calls a month. This is also probably a big county, but LA County is definitely the biggest. They range from, um, we have a budget that's 1.7 billion, and this is very interesting because I was out talking in West Virginia, and they said that was the state budget. They kept saying, are you sure you have that right? <laughs> they said, that's what our whole state gets, and that covers the state. And I said, yeah, it's actually, we have about 7,400 employees. We work 24 hours a day, 24-7. As we're speaking right now, probably about 100 calls are coming into the hotline. So you've probably got social workers all over just answering phones and sending them out to the command center. So, um, you know, I think that we, we sometimes get a bad rap. And I understand because we all do it, right? We all say we don't do it, but there's a car wreck and we all sort of slow down because we want to see the train wreck. <laughs> Even though we should it, I often ask myself, what sells news? Would it sell news if we said, oh, DCFS did a great job, we reunited this child? Or does it sell better news if a reporter says, child was murdered, even though we've been out there 10 times, what happened? We all want to sort of look at that that bad stuff. So we always want to try to build a good relationship with our um, our reporters and our feature journalists because there is a lot of really, really good stuff that goes on every day. And I think Dr. Sanders is going to talk about some of those things. What I wanted to share with you a little bit about is removal. Why do we remove kids? I mean, sometimes people think you just remove them to remove them. You guys are overtaking kids. When I joined the department in 1989, we had about 60,000 kids in custody, in foster care. Today, that number is roughly about 15,000, 16,000. So we've really done a lot of preventative services. We're bringing services in to say we don't necessarily have to remove. But I did want to give you guys some insight on why we remove, because I often think people don't really understand just as this situation, what had happened was, it, it wasn't all on there, but the young girl fell in love with her father and gotten pregnant, and he was promising her, well, just leave mom, and we're going to go off and have our own lives, not realizing that it's against the law. So we actually have the, the Welfare and Institution Code 300 covers sections A through J. And in those sections, that's what you can remove for kids for. So I'm gonna go through them very, very briefly, and I want you to be really engaged in this because I want, well, let me ask this question. How many of you in this room have ever been hit as a child? Like spanked or hit? Um, hit, not spanked on the butt, but any kind of a hitting, a slap, a pulling of a hair, a belt, any kind of hitting. By a parent. By a parent. So that would be me too. I kind of teased my parents. I said I would have been in foster care and I would have grown up in the system. They said, but we made you become a good person by using the belt. So <laughs> there's a lot of controversy about that. But it really is what we, because we get a lot of calls to our hotline. Sometimes our hotline just gives advice, believe it or not. We evaluate out about 1,300 calls a month where they're calling and saying, can I leave my 12-year-old home alone? Or what is legal? What can you do? What can you hit? A spanking without marks. What if you spank? You followed the law, you said, I spanked my child, and the child leaves a mark. If it leaves a mark, very, very good. So section A is physical abuse. Physical abuse is anything that leaves a mark. Do you think a spanking, how, how bad can a spanking be? How, how bad do you all think a spanking can be? Do you think it's good for kids to get spanked once in a while? What do you think? No? From personal okay. experience, yes. Uh, yes. <laughs> I am totally the way I am because my dad just had the fear of I can't 
and not, not cry in church and things like that. Just get ready for orderly. So this was a seven-year-old girl that got a spanking. That's not a spanking. That's a beat. Yeah. How many of you think, well, you're not social workers, but did the social worker do right by taking this child away into custody? Yes. Because yeah. it's, somebody said it, it's excessive. This is a beating. This is probably about 30 belt marks, excessively using a buckle. This was a seven-year-old who didn't do her homework. So in this case, we would say yes, we're going to <coughs> remove the child and we're going to file the 300A. So, you know, it doesn't matter what you hear out there, we can just go take kids because you cussed us out. No, no, no. Well, I've been cussed out many times. I've been called, this girl said she was going to slap the Barbie right out of me. I'm like, huh? <laughs> <laughs> she was, you know, going to threaten to kick my you-know-what. I'm like, okay, okay. So even though we go to a house, they might be volatile, they might be screaming, they might be gang members, we might know they have guns. You still have to fit it in the law. You just can't go, well, I think this is a good family to take. So a physical abuse case would be something like this versus we go out, maybe a child is spanked, but there isn't anything that's that. Um, so this what we would consider excessive. I'll just show you two more really quick on physical abuse. Um, this is a physical abuse case. This is a two and a half year old with a cigarette lighter on his leg. And this was because he didn't, he got matches because his parents smoked. So he just took matches and they said, we'll teach you to play with matches. Is that crossing the line or did the parent, because when we went out there, the mom said, I was just teaching him a lesson. I didn't want him to, you know, burn the house down. So how many of you think it's crossing the line? Great, and, and these are the things that a social worker, because we tend to over here, we just remove kids, we just remove kids, we just remove kids. We don't just remove kids, we're removing <coughs> kids if there's excessive, so we would file an A under physical abuse. Okay, the, the next section is, um, it's 300B like boy, and I always say broad, because a lot of stuff can fit into B because it's failure to protect general neglect. So it could be the drugs, the alcohol, um, anything that happens. Well, what about a dirty house? Do you think the department has that much authority to remove a kid for a dirty house, or do you think we just go out and tell them to clean it and come back? Excellent. Right. So it de that's a great, it depends on the degree of filthiness. So we might walk in a house and say, ugh. I mean, I've walked in houses and thought, oh, this isn't going to work. I can't breathe, but I know I have to go in there if there's babies. And it depends on the degree, if it's unhealthy, if it's unsafe. One example of that would be, and I don't know if you can see it, but you're more than welcome to pass them around, just end up somewhere. These are roaches inside a refrigerator. In this house, we had a three-month-old baby and a two-year-old. So this is actually the same house. That's the kitchen. Very hard to see, but they're actually using the restroom. They're, they're, it, they're, it's feces in the pots and pans. And if you look at the wall, there's roaches all stuck. So we have two small babies in this house. Now, we can't bottle up the smell for you because then you would be just, you're, you're more than welcome to. Um, in this kind of a situation, we would say it's a hazardous. You can't be living in these kind of situations. Here's what's very interesting also about dirty houses. With dirty houses, about 90% of the people who live in these homes have either mental illness or drug use. So it's not just like a dirty house. I remember going into a house once and she was making peach cobbler. I said, do you know there's like roaches in your peach cobbler? I was trying to be nice about it. And she said, it's not a big deal. The kids just take them off. Whoa. So most of us, you know, and then of course she offered me a piece and I politely said, no, thank you. We're not supposed to take food. <laughs> but so that would be something we would say would be crossing the line. The next um, form of abuse we can remove children for is 300C, and that's emotional abuse. Emotional abuse, you might hear, how hard is that really hard to prove? How can you prove it's emotional abuse? Um, some of the, it, it, it could be a little bit hard to um, prove, but we, um, for example, we have, this is a really bizarre one. We have, we, you're gonna see yellow on the kids' faces, it's because to protect their identity, we're not allowed to actually show their faces. 
But you can see this one, the kids are holding up gang signs. They have a gun that the police have determined is a real gun. Um, we have a two-year-old with a bong in his mouth. Um, what happens is there's, when they develop these, a lot of people don't know this, that's how the teacher in LA County at the elementary school was taught. You're mandated reporters if you develop film. So in these cases, they actually developed film and called DCFS and said, you've got to go out there. So this would be something we could file on. We can file on um, an emotional abuse. We can file on an emotional abuse. Um, this is another one. I mean, if you see black writing, it's because we blocked out names and, and stickers on faces. We're protecting the identity. But this is a little girl who actually draws herself hanging. She had a, the teacher saw this. When the social worker went to her house, she had a full plan of how she was going to kill herself that evening at 5 o'clock. So this would be something, when we went out there, there were other issues, but this could be something we could file the emotional abuse on. So does it kind of make your following, like the A is the physical, the B is the failure to protect, the C is the emotional abuse? Um, D, under the Welfare and Institution Code, is sexual abuse. Sexual abuse is anything. Um, I think the worst case of sexual abuse I had was a two-week-old with a venereal disease. So when I went out to the hospital, they told me there is absolutely no way this child could have gotten this except for intercourse. So in those cases, we would absolutely file. Now remember, this is important to note. If we file um, on the sexual abuse, we can also go back and file the emotional abuse as well. So it's not just one count. Sometimes we can throw in, unfortunately, you know, everything with it. So um, E is, um, E is, <coughs> Severe physical abuse if the child's under five. It's a little bit different. A is physical abuse. Remember, B, I mean E, sorry, word E, is severe. So I um, just want to warn you that if, you, if you're not used to this, some of these can be very bad, so I, I don't want to um, startle anybody. <coughs> this would be, actually, the girl that you saw in that photo that was out working on that case, her name's Elba. <laughs> She is probably one of the best social workers in the county. She's able to get kids to tell her everything. She's even able to get parents to confess. The police would go out and say, could you just go interview the parents for me? Because they'll tell you, but they won't tell, tell us. Um, this was a case where a stepmother was very angry at a boy for um, a potty training incident. And she put his hand in boiling water for about 10 seconds. You can tell this is a clean, when we say clean, you see it's, it's not a splatted accident, it's a very clean dip where she dips. So on this one, we would file an E count because it's a lot more serious because unfortunately this child's gonna have this arm for the rest of his life versus as bad as this one is, what is the difference? You guys are a smart group. This can be healed, it's bad. But this is something like an E is something that's going to be very, very serious. You're almost always going to go to jail. A parent who ever did it, if we give you the E, you're almost going to get um, get jail time. Um, I'll show you one more. Again, I just want to warn you that uh, some of these, are you guys up for this? <laughs> if you're not up for it, you don't have to look at it. I really like to do this down there because I really like to give you, we do this in our academy when we're training new social workers, it's a reality, it's sad, but this is what goes on. And so that people do have an understanding, I get why some kids do have to be removed. You know, I, I really get it, and we have done this many times where people go, we get it, we, we didn't quite understand it. And our goal is to help these families, but with many of these cases, they're really so bad, it would be a really bad thing to do. So this would also, um, is this too graphic? Okay, so we won't do the graphic one. <laughs> um, I'll show you one that's less graphic. Huh? Okay, if you feel like, yeah. Um, this one isn't as bad, but this is um, falling water. You can see a little baby's feet are very hard. And I don't think anybody, or I could be wrong, would anybody allow this baby to stay home? and maybe send the parents to parenting classes. So there's just some cases where we do have to, we do have to be involved. So that would be the E, and those are, are the worst. And then, um, so the E is, remember the difference between E is it's the severe. Um, F is, is a fatality. 
Sure, please do. Why is the section E designated only for children under five? It's, a, it's in the penal code. I'm not sure. Uh, it is in the penal code that it's under five. It's not to say that's a very good question. It's not to say that the department can't push to, to get an okay. E count on an older kid, but it's generally a child under five because they're at the most risk. Uh, and F, um, the law changed about three years ago, which is the FAC used to have to be convicted of causing a fatality. Now you just have to be, if the child died in your home under suspicious circumstances, and we can file an F count. Um, because you're not social workers, and I don't want to set anybody, I, I definitely won't show any of the F, but if you're really interested, you're certainly able to come up after class and I can show you um, that. Now, a G count would be, a G count is no provisions for support. Um, parents are, they just robbed a bank and they're both got a 25 year jail sentence and we're gonna file a G because there's no provisions for support. Our parents perhaps are mentally ill and they're not willing to take their meds, they're not willing to, we can say, these were two little kids. This is actually um, one of my cases I did many years ago as a worker. These kids were thrown in a trash can. The kids were, were in a trash can, and that's why we have something in LA County, probably in most counties, that say you have to get out there now. You, you don't stop and talk to your friend, get the call, and get out there. And I remember on this call, because I called the police department, I said, I'm in route, I'm about seven minutes away, but meet me at the corner of Florence and this street because they hear babies crying in a trash can. Um, when we picked up the kids, clearly you can see they're tattered, they're dirty. We didn't know their names. We called them Jane Doe and John Doe. We took them to, a, to the county hospital to just measure how old we think they were by their bones. Um, unfortunately, nobody came forth for these children. And so we filed a G count, which is no provision for <coughs> support, failing to protect these kids. So that would be an example if you throw your kids in the trash or you do something <coughs> like that. Um, under the Welfare and Institution Code H, that's basically free for adoption. Um, remember the boy with the burnt hand, with the little, um, he was definitely free for adoption because his stepmother got um, eight years in prison. So because we have so much time to reunite, we have 12 months to we have reunification, in some of these cases, probably the E count, you're going to jail for a while, so you probably won't be able to reunite, and then we'll talk about permanency. Um, and then we have an I count, which is cruelty, and almost most of these ones I'm showing you would definitely be um, a cruelty count, and, um, <coughs> and J. J is the last one of the, of the Welfare and Institution Code 300, and J is um, at risk for sibling abuse. That means if one, if we remove one child, we can remove all, saying that there's a you know the chances are they could be abused as well. So, do you have any questions at all regarding any of these? <coughs> Why social workers remove kids? Um, do these kids go back? What is our department doing? Let me ask you this question. Can we remove kids for head lice? Or do you just go out and tell them to get the red? What do you think? Because <laughs> the house is so dirty? We had a call and the school said we sent the little girl home with head lice about four weeks ago and we never heard back from the family. So can you guys go out and check on, on the kid? So my partner and I go out and we check on the kid. She has literally golf ball like holes in her head from their lives. So I said to mom, what were you doing? Show me what you did to treat her head. And she brought out the rage. She said, I was spraying her with rain. Oh. How many of you would remove that kid for head lice? Yeah. So yes, I'm saying mom's using rage. She's, when, it, when head lice are this visible, don't start itching. I swear my hair's <laughs> coming. <laughs> Every time I talk about head lice, um, when you can actually see when you can see the head lice as you can on this kid, we would consider that pretty severe. Now, it's not like we're gonna run out and take everyone's kids because they have head lice. But normally, I think somebody back there said, usually when you're going in, you're gonna find that filthy house. But it can happen. I mean, kids that go to private school could catch head lice from someone else. It depends on the severity. Like the girl where the mother was being raped, we took that kid into custody and we had a successful court case. Because that, be, that would be a little bit different. So, yes. Yeah, it seems like a number of these cases, I mean, they seem pretty clear cut. And I imagine that there's a number of cases that kind of fall in some sort of gray area. 
Um, can you give an example of maybe one of those or one of those kind of decisions that it, where it's, you know, could go either way? Yeah, you know, really sure. that's actually a great question for anybody in here who's going into child welfare. Those are always your toughest ones. It's not these ones where we know what we have to do. It's the ones that you go out and you have a gut feeling that something isn't right. Um, I, I'll never forget a case I went on and, and the girl had been sexually abused, but the you know boyfriend was out of the house. We were trying to do preventative services with the family. And um, my partner and I left. We parked up down the street. And guess as soon as we left, guess who's walking right back in the house? Boyfriend. So we knock on the door and now boyfriend's there. So now we can say this is one. But at the time, it was very difficult because everybody denied the boyfriend was in the house. Everybody, no, we didn't see him. We don't know where he's at. So the gray ones are the hardest ones. And you raised such a good question because many times you're going to hear the department went out. Why didn't we take the kids? Why didn't we leave them there? Now the child's dead. And it could perhaps have been that when we went out, we just didn't have enough either way. Maybe we go out, we tell mom, you need to drug test. And mom, you know, somehow miraculously tests clean. We have to be able to build a case that we're going to win in court. So yeah, the great ones are usually the most difficult ones. Um, also, the custody battles are very difficult. I always say, give me any child who says, don't give me custody battles, because they just call and make up stuff about each other. <coughs> you know, he's doing this, he's doing that. So those are very difficult. You and then you and then you. Um, so my question actually goes back to the head lice um, infants. Um, so I used to teach fifth grade, and I had a student who had perpetual head lice. She had head lice nonstop. Um, and I guess one of the what it raises for me is like, so I knew parents, I knew the family situation, there were 11 of them living in one apartment um, in New York City. And, but basically like, what do you do when it's an instance of poverty? Poverty versus, versus exactly. That's, that's a I'm great saying. question and it's something we're toying with our social workers all the time. What is the difference? We go out to many families in LA County and probably all over the country, the economy's bad and families now have to move in together and, and it makes it very difficult. I'm not sure if you're familiar with ASPA, but that's the Adoption Safe Family Act where it says if we remove kids, you have to meet the qualifications of a foster parent. And many of these relatives are barely feeding their own kids, so it makes it very, very difficult, really, really difficult. We're just sort of training them to look at the dip. Poverty in and itself is not, actually homelessness, believe it or not, is not a reason to take a child into custody. We have to build around it that the child isn't getting fed, they're not getting medical care, they're not getting, um, but this kid with the head lice, because the mother was using rage and because the mother was very uncooperative and the kid really suffered, we were able to get the eye count for cruelty that, because we asked the kid and she would scream when the raid was getting on, going on her head. You imagine raid on open sores, and she's getting hit, and mom's pulling her hair every time she's screaming. So this kid really had a really, really tough time, and it, we had to bite. We had to get shower caps and put the shower cap just to transport her in the police car because we couldn't put her in our cars with the seating. The, the lice were that bad. They were pretty much just eating out of the head. Maybe this goes without asking, but are there ever reunification services in cases of sexual abuse? That's a great question. Uh, you know, basically, yes, reunification is um, people get to reunify with kids. Usually, if it's this pretty serious sexual abuse case, father will usually get time in prison, so there's a good chance they won't reunite. It's very rare that we send the kid back home with the perpetrator. It all depends on the mother. And that many times, we ask kids, I will always ask the child, well, what did your mom say? And then they'll say, well, she just told me not to say anything. I had one little kid say, well, she put a bell on my door, so every time she heard the door ring, she'd get up. That's not safety. That's a mother that's not protecting this kid. Um, versus you can ask the same kid, and she can say, well, I've never told. And then you can talk to mom if mom's willing to get a restraining order and be protective and get her kid medical examined and in counseling and work with the department. Then those are kids that we would reunite, but certainly not on parents. So we kind of have to assess that mother to sort of see. I think we're going to take just one more and then switch okay, and leave great. tons of time for questions for the end. Great. If you could be czar of the department and have the authority to make any one administrative change in the department, is in training, selection, and so forth, so long as it didn't cost more money overall, what change would you make to reduce the number of instances where, in retrospect, the child should have been taken but wasn't? 
Wow, that's such a good question. That is a great question. Um, the first change I would make is to bring Dr. Sanders back as the director, but that won't happen. <laughs> um, you know, it's something that I've just spoken to our recent director about, and it's, it's doing tr on hands training. We can sit here in a class and they can learn all the theory about social work and we can tell them about all these great tools, but we want more. We want at the academy, I want them to come up and I want them to role play. I want them to role play these situations so that they can think twice. And I'm gonna give you one quick example and then I'll be done. We had a case where, are you familiar with family preservation? It's these agencies we're working to keep, and, and they're good agencies, but we had a family preservation worker call and say, I just left this house. This kid is screaming. She doesn't want to be with her mom. There's something wrong with her arm. It's swollen. She's got bruises on the side of her leg. So the social worker goes out there and says to mom, you know, we got this call. We need to, to see you. I mean, if it was Alba, she would have had the kid in her car, but they're not all Albas. They went out, and the mom says, you know, She's really hard to get to sleep. If you could just come back in the morning, it will be much better. How many of you would have left? No, you're, you're all naturals. <laughs> Most of us wouldn't have left. We could have done two things. We could have said, you either need to cooperate with us or we're going to do an investigative warrant. We now do warrants. We're going to get an investigative warrant. <coughs> we're going to come in here, we're going to look at this child. So she tells the social worker, I'll tell you what, let's not wake her up, but I'll let you, I'll unzip her, she was two years old, I'll unzip her from here to here and you can see. Well, remember, was there any injuries here? Where were the injuries? The arm and the side of the leg. Unfortunately, it goes back, the worker left and said, I really didn't want to disturb the family. It was a bad ending. It was a really bad ending. So to answer that instance, it's you've got to role play. You have to say, what would you guys, just tell me what you would have done. Sorry, mom, this is, we're not, this is not gonna be something we're debating. You're either gonna cooperate or getting <coughs> more, but we're, we're not gonna leave this house until we see your baby's arm. And so I think training um, is, is a huge, huge thing. And when I say training, I don't just mean get in a classroom and learn social work 101. I mean, take these real cases and make these people come up and pretend they're social workers. And I'm the crazy mother who won't listen to you guys and giving you a hard time. I want you to tell me how you would handle that case. So that is, I just wanted to leave you with, that is sort of why we take kids into custody. It's not that we want to, we're, we're really not wanting to do that, but as you can see, and that's just a very teeny, teeny little sample, some kids do need to be removed. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Sanders, and we're here for Q&A, so please think of your questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Sanders, do you understand how to use this machine? No. <laughs> a pointer? We don't have to sit? Yeah, I think, I think we should help if we get this to be like a slideshow. So, so the bottom? The other bottom? side. Other side. This one? No, the screen. Right there. Slideshow. There we go. Then you go like apparently like this. Oh, there you go. That looks good. So good evening to everybody. Um, I really want to thank Daniel for the, um, and all of you for kind of seeing the important role of the media in this issue, and I'm going to touch on that in kind of a variety of comments throughout what I talk about, and we'll kind of see a theme woven through here. And also, um, Jennifer is, is, you know, I was, as you heard, responsible for Children and Family Services in Los Angeles County, and there were about 7,000 employees when I was there, and Jennifer is probably <laughs> the best. I mean, she oh. is <laughs> outstanding. No, I, I mean that seriously. She is outstanding. She was supervisor, I think, when I came to the department and really stood out as somebody who knew what she was doing. And I think all of you have had this opportunity to kind of hear from her and learn from this. So in, um, in my time, I'm going to be try and be fairly brief. I'm going to cover three areas. One, I'll talk a little about my background, and particularly as it kind of connects to some of the issues that we're talking about. Second, I'm going to talk a little about kind of what's happening in child welfare and just kind of a changing narrative that's happening over the last few years. 
And then finally, I'll talk about kind of assessments of abuse and neglected children. And Jennifer really talked about Los Angeles County, talked about California. I'll try and present somewhat of a national context so that you have a sense of what's going on nationally and particularly how Los Angeles fits into the work being done nationally. So let me start with, um, with my background. And it's, um, it's interesting because of this theme of the um, media and child welfare. I actually am a child psychologist by training. And I have a um, PhD in psychology, went to the University of Minnesota, and my dream was to be the director of, of Children's Mental Health Services, run a clinic in Minneapolis. And I was happily doing that in 1992. And so I was working for Hennepin County, which is a county that Minneapolis is part of, and working as a child psychologist and running the Children's Mental Health Program in Minneapolis. And the, the largest paper in Minnesota, the um, Minneapolis Star Tribune, ran a series of articles about the child protection system in Hennepin County. And that series was entitled License to Abuse. And it was talking about the department making terrible decisions and placing children with relatives who later abuse them. And these relatives had criminal histories. And the question was, how can the the notion that the apple doesn't far, fall far from the tree, how can you place children with relatives? And for those of you who have not necessarily been part of a child welfare system, what happens when there's a crisis is everybody gets fired, or at least the leaders get fired. And so literally, three levels of management in Hennepin County were fired over this series of articles. And I was about the only person left who knew anything about children. And so they tapped me on the children and said, you want to run child protection? Interestingly, that's not a unique experience. And I think that when we talk about some of the issues and, and kind of the intersection between the role of the media and child welfare, the, the issue of leadership turnover and what happens and what can be expected to happen in systems is a theme that I'm going to come back to later, but I think is, is, is not unique across the country. And so um, fast forward 10 years, and 2003, I was recruited to come to Los Angeles County. And Los Angeles had had five directors in the five years prior to my starting, and nine, year, nine directors in the 20-year history of the agency. And when, when I came, the editorial, the lead editorial in the Los Angeles Times was entitled, Welcome, Now Get Busy. And <laughs> it laid out a plan for what needed to happen in child welfare in Los Angeles County. And actually, it was a pretty good plan. They never came back to it ever again in the, five, in the three and a half years that I was there, never referenced what they talked about in the editorial. So there was a big splash, all of this activity about what needs to happen and very little after that. And Jennifer talked some about the numbers in Los Angeles County. The one thing that I would just reinforce is during the course of a year, there are about 170,000 investigations in Los Angeles County. The piece I would touch on, though, is that there really is zero tolerance for any error in those 170,000 investigations, that the department cannot make a mistake. And there are actually very few fields like that where you expect out of 170,000 investigations. <coughs> There was the um, headlines when I started were um, Los Angeles was the most dangerous system in the country. I don't know if that was the LAD and the news had a series of articles talking about why Los Angeles was the most dangerous system in the country. And actually, my first day or second day on the job, a reporter from um, the local NBC affiliate came up to me and said, you know that I could get people from across the county to come and pick at your office because people are so dissatisfied with the work of Los Angeles County. I thought, what a great welcome. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, progress is made, and so a number of good changes, I think, that um, were pretty, there's strong consensus that a number of very positive changes were made. And, um, and I left about five years ago. There have subsequently been five directors in DCFS in the five years since I've been gone. So, the, when you think about some of the issues that we're talking about, and again, this issue of the intersection between the media and, the, and child welfare, this is a, a big issue. And I'm now at Casey Family Programs. I won't go into a lot of detail, but Casey's the 
largest foundation in the country that focuses exclusively on foster care. The area that I'm responsible for areas are the state work that we do. We work in about 48 different states, and we have um, work in those states really looking at how to improve outcomes for children, and I heard somebody identify themselves working in public policy. We have, um, I have responsibility for our policy work, and we've done a lot of work in D.C., which I can um, talk about in our questions. And I think there are some documents that we sent here. They're all there, there. yeah. So, so. so pick stuff up if you want to see more about Casey. So let me shift to this issue of the changing narrative and um, what's going on in child welfare. Question, um, and Jennifer asked some things. I don't think this came up in the question she asked. Just how many people, how many, how many foster children are there in California? People know? Yes, what would you do? 30. 30,000. 30, <coughs> Any other guesses? It's around 400,000. So, um, good, interesting range. In California, <laughs> there are today about 54,000 children in foster care. Your number, actually, the 400,000, is about how many there are in the United States. Um, how many children are placed in a year in the United States into foster care? About 260,000 a year. So 54,000 in California, 400,000 nationally, about 260,000 placed a year. In California, 10 years ago, California actually peaked at over 100,000 children in foster care. The United States peaked at about 600,000 children in foster care. Today, there's about 400,000. And the number of children placed every year is down by about 50 to 60,000. And you heard Jennifer's numbers for Los Angeles County. They've gone from over 50,000 to about 20,000. So today, the system is significantly smaller than at any time in the last 15 to 20 years. And that's actually a, a, a significant change. And, actually, and probably few people outside of this room really know that. And I would posit that if there had been a 20, this is from 2005 to 2011, if there had been a 20% reduction in crime rate over the last six years, we would all know about it and we would hear about it. Or if cancer treatment, there had been an improvement of 20% in the, the rate of, of individuals who are living as a result of new treatment, we would hear about it. It appears that, in, and during the same time frame, the safety for children by all of the measures that are used in the child welfare system is improved. So safety appears to have improved and fewer children are in foster care. I, I think that this changing narrative in part is that it appears that jurisdictions are more effective at prevention of initial abuse or neglect, at preventing re-abuse of children once they've been abused, and you saw some of the pictures from Jennifer, and also more effective at moving children to permanency. And I think that as, as I go through the rest of this, that's an important context to keep in mind. <coughs> I'm gonna skip over that. Let me, um, let me, talk a little about the context. And Jennifer presented some information, but let me provide a context around this issue of, of assessment of children and placement of children. One of the things that happens nationally is that child welfare and child protection is very much a locally driven issue, driven by states and driven locally. So California is a county administered states. There are 58 counties in California. Each county really sets its policy for how to address child welfare issues with general guidance from the state. The federal government requires some kind of screening that states have to have a screening process, and there has to be some ability to identify children who've been abused or neglected, and then the federal government makes Title IV-E, which I won't go into detail about, as and children who've been abused or neglected and meet certain criteria are eligible for for benefits under Title IV, and generally those benefits are foster care placement. States really define the standard of proof. So in the pictures you saw, states generally define what the standard of proof is for children to be identified as having been abused or neglected. What constitutes abuse and neglect? And I'll give an example. The um, 
Jennifer talked about the categories in the Welfare and Institution Code, but a number of states identify, for example, educational neglect as a form of neglect. California does not. And so there's wide variation across states as to what actually constitutes abuse or neglect. States identify the process for investigation, so how long an investigation can take, and also what gets investigated. And so some states require an investigation if a mandated reporter calls into the hotline. So it really varies tremendously from state to state. Just to give some general numbers, and Jennifer talked about the calls into Los Angeles County. So generally, if you look at the average across the country, if there are 100 calls, for every 100 calls, about 60 cases are investigated. About 15 to 20 are substantiated, meaning the worker believes that abuse or neglect is occurring. About five to 10 receive some kind of services, and two to five are actually placed in out of home placement. Huge differences from state to state, huge differences from county to county. And actually, one of the things that um, Jennifer didn't talk about, but huge differences from worker to worker and unit to unit within counties in terms of some of those decisions. And as I said, it's probably the most important decision that a child protection agency makes. One of the things as an administrator that you have to look at is this continual balance, and this, that's partly what this captured, of safety, which is paramount. And I think somebody asked a question about kind of those gray area situations, and I think that's a really difficult issue because that's the majority of calls that come in are more gray area than, than the extreme. So there's a continual balance of assuring children are safe but also assuring the rights of children to be with their families and the rights that families have, the rights that parents have, as well as public expectations, which in many ways drive how much the public is willing to pay for service, and that determines directly how many workers you have to send out for how many calls there are. The laws that are in place, not only laws that protect children, but the laws that identify the, under criminal statute what families can be charged with, as well as the role of the media, which really is informing the public in, and setting public opinion in many cases. Jennifer talked about, and I'm going to shift into now more the reasons for placement and kind of specifically some of the issues of assessment of children who need out-of-home placement. So Jennifer talked about in California some of the reasons for placement, but generally there is usually some kind of substantiated abuse or neglect. And as I said, the level of, of proof varies dramatically across the country. So some states require a very stringent proof that a worker go out and believe that abuse or neglect is hurting. As a matter of fact, close to the, the, um, the standard of beyond a reasonable doubt. And other states, it really is a belief that abuse or neglect has occurred. So a huge variation in what's required for proof. But some kind of substantiation is generally required. And then some assessment of the child's safety. And, gen and again, it varies dramatically, but generally some immediate threat of harm to the child due to neglect, physical abuse, or sexual abuse. And it generally also has to be within a family or a facility licensed by the state. And so um, I think somebody raised a question about, or Jennifer may have raised an example of a neighbor abusing a child. Well, that's not going to be in and of itself. That would not be a physical abuse finding in a child protection system. It may be neglect because the parent didn't protect the child, but it's not a physical abuse situation if it's not within the family or in a licensed setting. And, you know, in the, we talked about, or Jennifer talked about the extremes of physical abuse and sexual abuse, et cetera. But, and, and the issue of um, that in California, homelessness is not a reason for placement. But if you look at generally the reasons that children are placed outside of purely the kind of extreme physical abuse and neglect, homelessness is one of the reasons, even though it may be characterized as something else. One of the things that Jennifer didn't talk about, but is a theme across the country, prenatal exposure to substance abuse, is a, is a major theme, and, and in some states is in and of itself a reason for placement. As I mentioned, educational neglect, Child behavioral health reasons, particularly for older children in foster care, are a number of there because of child behavioral health reasons. Delinquent behavior, about 7% of the children in foster care across the country are actually in the juvenile justice system. And then, as Jennifer mentioned, there's a high correlation for domestic violence. So 
Let me talk about just three things, and I'll, I'll close after that, with, in terms of the assessment of abuse and neglect of children. So I've just provided the context. You have some of the detail about Los Angeles, but let me talk about three things that are um, kind of critical in some of the latest thinking across the country in actually assessing abuse and neglect of children. One, the first thing I'll talk about, talk about are the concepts of safety and risk. And there, over the last few years, people have begun to think more about safety and risk as being separate concepts. Safety is really gauging the immediate threat of harm for the child. And much of what Jennifer talked about is that issue of immediate harm. A child who's been abused, what might happen to them if they go back home tomorrow? And so one of the issues that Jennifer raised is the perpetrator access to the child. Well, that is part of that assessment of safety for the child. The second concept is risk, and that's the likelihood of re-abuse in the future. So it's not necessarily the immediate danger to the child, but the likelihood of re-abuse. So for example, the age of a child raises the likelihood a younger child is more likely to be re-abused in the future. So it would be a factor that would need to be considered. And so there are a number of other areas that raise the risk that a child might be re-abused going into the future. Obviously, a history of abuse in the family is one. So generally, what happens today is most jurisdictions across the country look at both assessing safety and assessing risk. And there are kind of three tools that are used in general in most systems, in many systems across the country. I wouldn't say most, but in many. One is called structured decision making. And actually, Los Angeles and most counties in California use structured decision making. And I won't go into detail, but one of the elements of structural decision making, structured decision making, is this issue of risk. The way that risk is determined under structured decision making is actually similar to the way it's determined in insurance. It's an actuarial based system that looks at families who re abuse their children and then look at, look at the characteristics of those families. And then you can say what the probability is of somebody coming into the system today if they look like a family who has typically re-abused their children. Obviously, the risk of re-abuse is much higher. Otherwise, it might be lower. So it's an actuarial-based risk assessment, which in many ways is seen as an advancement in the field of, of decision making. Second is, the second kind of tool is through an organization called Action for Child Protection. The federal government has a, a, a network of resource centers that are intended to provide support for child protection agencies across the country. And Action for Child Protection is one of those. So they work in a lot of states to help them determine how to assess risk and how to assess safety. And then finally, there's a tool, and I'm going to touch on this in, um, in a little more detail, called Science of Safety. And actually, it's a practical, family-involved approach to safety. Generally, what happens is that children are placed because of safety, that there is a belief that there's an immediate threat of harm, and that risk determines whether you provide services <coughs> to the family or not. So if there's a likelihood of re-abuse, you probably want to provide services to the family, even if you don't place the child. So that's really the importance of having a separate safety and risk assessment. That this families, and Jennifer talked about family preservation, that you might want to provide preservation services to. You probably want to if the risk of re-abuse is high, but if there is immediate harm to the child, then you probably need to look at placement. <coughs> Signs of safety also encourages family involvement, and that goes into that second area. So one is the kind of assessment of risk and safety. The second area that jurisdictions are looking at across the country, and certainly has happened in Los Angeles County, is team decision making. And that is, historically, a worker would go out, they would see the child, see the family, ask a series of questions, come back, talk to their supervisor, and make a decision about whether or not the child should be placed in a home care. What's happened is that many jurisdictions and others across the country have seen that if you bring people together who know the child and family, whether professionals or other family members, you can actually make better informed decisions. And so jurisdictions have recently, over the last five years or so, really aggressively looked at formal strategies to bring people together before a placement occurs to get as much information as possible from family members and from other professionals who are involved in, in situations.
we have, I'm going to give a couple of examples of this, or at least one example, that in Minnesota, New England, parts of California, that under both signs of safety, which is kind of the family engagement, safety assessment, and team decision making, that there are new strategies to engage families. So Maine has been particularly aggressive at this. They make the initial decision about whether a child is safe within 72 hours. If the situation is deemed as unsafe, then a trained facilitator must convene a family team meeting. And the family can bring in friends, members of their church, whoever else might be involved. And the facilitator identifies safety concerns, the parental capabilities, and potential solutions. The family is fully involved, no secrets, and no child in Maine is actually removed from their home without this intensive process. What we found at Casey is that agencies are less likely to place children out of home than they were a decade ago. Safety plans help to control immediate threats to child safety, and safety plans use relatives to temporarily care for children in, in arrangements. And also, this issue of engaging families, so Jennifer again talked about extreme situations, but across the country, about 70% of children who are removed from their families are reunified. And so it's really critical to engage a family as quickly as possible, and that's one of the issues that this kind of approach allows for. The final area that I'll just touch on is the role of law enforcement, and Jennifer talked a little about that. There are really two primary reasons that law enforcement is involved in these cases. One is for criminal prosecution, and there's a subset of child abuse cases that are prosecuted criminally, and it's absolutely critical for law enforcement to be involved early on in that process. The second reason is that in, in a number of states, law enforcement actually is the only entity that has authority for placement. And so while people often think of the child protection worker as making placement decisions, in many states it's law enforcement that makes that decision. Some jurisdictions, and you may have seen coverage in the media recently, Arizona being an example, but some jurisdictions are beginning to hire former police investigators for their child protection investigation work. That happens in New York City right now, and Arizona is contemplating a similar <laughs> model. In addition, one jurisdiction, Florida, actually contracts out some of the, the investigations to their sheriffs, again, as part of a law enforcement process. And the last example that I'll touch on is Nevada. And Nevada, Clark County, Nevada, 41% of the child protection petitions had, had law enforcement involvement. The, the, and for many, in many cases, it was purely because of substance abuse. And that may or may not be a reason for placement, but generally purely involved parental substance abuse doesn't generally result in a placement unless there are other factors to be considered. And so the, there was concern about that in Clark County. The, they created a 24-hour, 24-7 emergency response unit that worked directly with law enforcement. And what they saw was a 50% drop in child removal rates when they had social workers available to law enforcement at the time that law enforcement went out. So those are really the three themes in assessment that I wanted to talk about. The structured approaches to safety and risk, the team decision making, and working with law enforcement. I'm just going to um, close on with a couple of headlines that are coming from different places across the country. I think these all could have been picked out of Los Angeles or many other jurisdictions in California. Um, and you can see some of the themes, but it really is about this issue of placement, children being hurt, and, and the role the media plays in driving public opinion. One of the things that I wanted to touch on is that, that there's a strong belief among many child welfare officials that media headlines actually drive calls to the child protection agency. And so crisis, crisis headlines mean there are more calls from the public to the child welfare agency. And it creates a cycle that isn't particularly, I think most child welfare officials would say, not particularly helpful because it brings many, many more children to the agency. And while in some ways that may be a good thing, 
remember what I said about the 100 calls that come into the agency, that really only about 10 of those calls get services. And so the vast majority of people who come to a child welfare agency get either screened out or get an investigation. And I think the big question is kind of what are the implications of that in the community. So I'll stop right there and I will open up for a question on the Thank you, guys. Everybody and try to see as many as we can get done before we have to close. Um, I'll turn this off so you can see. Um, you want to run it or should I run it? Maybe we'll, 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 we'll go back to the board. We'll go back to the We had the whole first hour we got people already thinking about these topics, so they are yeah, ready, ready to go. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so right, everyone can pick. So we'll go one, two, three. Uh, uh, Mr. Sanders talked a lot about how uh, individual counties and states determine a lot of their social welfare policy, how they decide how they want to interact with uh, cases of abuse. Do you think that there needs to be a federal standard, or do you think it's better to leave states and counties to interpret how they wish? Because my gut feeling is that there needs to be kind of a federal set of standards that says these are the minimum requirements of what is determined in kind of case. Um, it's Great question, and also very complicated. The, um, so, <coughs> try and think of the best way to, to respond with um, kind of some sequence to this. I think it's important to think of the role that the federal government plays, and so part of that role is what they're willing to pay for. And so states and counties that paid for more of the child protection system than the federal government does. What the federal government, where the federal government does set some minimum standards is where they primarily pay for, which is out-of-home placement. So, and um, Jennifer talked about some of the issues of licensing of relatives, for example. So the federal government sets some minimum standards for safety for children who are gonna be placed in out-of-home care. That's probably appropriate because they pay a large percentage of children who are in out-of-home care but they really don't pay very much for investigations, for assessments of abuse and neglect, for family preservation services, for a real range of the kinds of supports paid for within the child welfare system. So I think that, the, that part of the question really has to be not only what could the federal government set as standards, but what as a country are we willing to actually say the federal government has a responsibility to pay for. And if there's a willingness to actually pay for some of those minimum standards, I think that, you know, I, I was actually at an event uh, last week and I was remarking that when I was in Los Angeles, I was always amazed that you cross the border from, from Lakewood to Santa Ana, from Los Angeles County to Orange County, and you have a completely different system. And that doesn't seem to make a lot of sense. But how you, how you manage that when you think about kind of the role of payment becomes a big issue. So um, Jennifer, you said um, that there was a case where you had a gut feeling about something uh, and then the boyfriend came back. I'm just wondering if as a supervisor, can you just tell your team, look, if you have a gut feeling, go ahead and take action. I'll, I'll cover your back. I'll do whatever it takes. Or is there... Is there a cost reason or is it an evidence reason? Why? You know, that, that's actually another really great question because we were we were discussing a child fatality we had um, it was just signed Dr. Sanders last Thursday. And it was um, it was a 12-year-old boy who had literally been getting called into the child protection hotline since the day he was born. And we convened, and that was my question <coughs> to the supervisors, why weren't you going back and asking? So to answer that question, it is really a supervisor's role to go back, and I was a supervisor for about five years, and I'm sure my workers hated me, because every time they brought me a case to close, I have like a hundred stickies. Did you find this, 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 this? And by the, you know, they're like, forget it, I'll just take it. And I said, no, 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 you don't have to do that, but go. So the, to answer that, it's really the supervisor who can go back and say, you know, we can't detain on a gut feeling. I can never go to court and say, I just think something's going to happen. I just, remember we talked about the WITCO 300 with those subdivisions. Somehow I have to fit it in there. But keep in mind, we don't have to go out and close the case that day. If I got a gut feeling, of course, you know, we ask parents, do you use drugs? They're always going to say no. I used to just ask parents, can you tell me when that, it's amazing how you can just sort of do a ruse and trick people without lying. I would just say to mom, when did you last use? And they'd always answer, oh, two weeks. That means two days. Two months means two weeks. I mean, I kind of got it. So I could just get them to tell me. So 
on the gut, no, you can't detain on the gut, but you can certainly go, I don't feel good about closing this, so you shouldn't just go back and close the case. Um, so this is my question. Um, I don't know, it, it comes across to me that like journalism can be seen as like this necessary evil. Like on one end, it's needed <laughs> for you to report and get these stories out, but on the other end, um, it just can become that evil thing with the headlines and things of that nature. So. For me, it's just like, how do you overcome those barriers where you're able, because when these cases are under investigation, there's only a certain amount of information that you're going to be able to give me. So how can a journalist still report the news while at the same time gathering that contextual information, that content that's needed to go beyond the basic little JJ was beat to death here, and it doesn't like look like the blame is being placed upon the ABC. Right, that's such a great question, and, and I can just tell you, in LA <coughs> County, we refer to the LA Times as every, oh, Dale, don't let the LA Times, I mean, the LA Times get that, don't let the LA Times, we are constantly telling our staff, pretend this case is gonna be on the front of the LA Times, which is sad, because, but it's exactly like Dr. Sanders said, the minute there's an article in the newspaper, I don't know, I'm sure you get it up here, um, Miramontes Elementary, there was a the teacher molesting kids. We had 29 calls the next day uh, kids remembering their teachers molesting them 15 years ago. So you really have to go, it, it just spiked up all our calls. Every call was coming in that a kid had been molested at a school, which is, I mean, I have a friend that's a teacher and said, I, I, want, I don't want to teach. I don't want to put my hand and say, good job, because the kid's going to say I was touched. So it sometimes creates a frenzy and the media has a lot of power, I got to tell you. The media has a lot of power. And it was really funny because when I asked my director if I could come here, he said, a reporter, huh? I said, no, but he writes positive stories. <laughs> <laughs> he actually looks at it from a different perspective than Garrett. And he said, okay, then with that said, you can go. So, so you guys have such an important, for those of you who are going to be journalists, you raise such a question. Do, you don't have all those answers. Um, and usually it's, it's a tough one. It's, it's really tough. One. But isn't the department, I mean, typically, I mean, the department has this, and I know this from, from when I started writing for the LA Weekly, and I had a pretty adversarial relationship with LA County, um, the Department of Children and Family Services, and, you know, they, I got, I got, like, they wouldn't give me any information. Right. Right. So at some point, you know, like, what is the responsibility level, I think, also, like, look, we're trying to create a res higher responsibility level among journalists and folks in policy who are going to be kind of doing the policy that's going to help kids. But what is the responsibility on the child welfare side? What is your guys' responsibility to be more transparent and 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 be able to talk about these things more frankly? You know, I, I, I think that's a really good question. And I, in um, presenting the headlines, I uh, should be clear, I don't see the media in a negative light, even though I was a child welfare director for 13 years. I mean, a lot of people <laughs> would say you should. I mean, but I actually see the role as being vital to this, the way the system should work. That it is a public system. It's not a private system. And the public has to know what they're paying for and what they're and whether they're getting what they're paying for. And I and that's nobody can do that but the media. I mean I, I think it's absolutely critical. I think that the that my views are probably at an extreme end because I don't think um, a lot of my colleagues, former colleagues share it. But um, I was very active in Minnesota in the push to open juvenile court because I think that the I think that issue of the public needing to be aware of what they're paying for and what they're getting is paramount and that the only way that can happen is if there is openness and transparency in the system. It, it just can't happen any other way. And, it, and I used to always say, it's not my responsibility to keep all of these children safe. It really is a public responsibility. And we're carrying out the public will. And we can only do that if the public is informed. And so I, I think there's an absolute responsibility on the part of child welfare systems to push for more openness, even in the face of opposition because of the, some of the questions about confidentiality. I think that 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 issue of the public being aware is absolutely critical. That's where I think it's so important for the media to be informed, because I think that to play the role of informing the public without being informed, whether it's because there isn't sufficient information coming from the system, or because the, the <coughs> journalists covering aren't knowledgeable enough, I think in both cases is, is a problem. Is that? That's great. And I just have to say for a second, I want to go back to your question. Jennifer answered it one way. Because Jennifer is a great supervisor, great program manager, and great deputy director. 
As an administrator, what always worried me is there are 3,000 social workers in Los Angeles County, and do you really want every one of them making that decision? I mean, and in some cases, the answer is absolutely not. If they all have supervisors like Jennifer, then the answer is yes, but they don't. And I think that's one of the real challenges, is how you balance that, where you have a worker that may not be that good. I mean, there will be some, no matter what you do. And I, you know, I always say in Los Angeles County, if it's 10%, it's still 300 workers. And so, you know, if you have a bad worker and a bad supervisor, it's a lethal combination, potentially. And so how do you manage that? And, and look at making decisions within certain parameters and not allowing as much judgment, but also knowing that the really good people need to have that judgment, and it's a real challenge. Right, and I think Dr. Sanders just brought up a great point. I remember when I was in ARA, which is an assistant regional man administrator, and I had supervisors, I would look at their stats, and I would say, I remember calling someone in and say, do you just have the best luck on the planet because you should buy me lottery tickets? Supervisors, I said, your worker hasn't taken a kid in a, like a year and a half. When the average worker was, the t not that we're in a contest, we're not, but when the average worker in a year was taking 50 or 60 kids and this person didn't take one, I started to pull their cases. And I, I can't even begin to tell you what I found, but let's just say that that person had time to sit home and think without a paycheck for a while. Because, so it really, if, if you don't have this level of looking, it's just nobody's that lucky. Nobody's that lucky. With the 160,000 calls coming in, there is some stuff, really bad stuff going out there. So. Yes, please. Oh, I have two questions. Um, the first was, what are specific um, ideas that either of you have to make um, child protective services more open to journalism? And then I'll ask a, an unrelated second question. Okay. Um, I think, uh, I, I can just speak from personal experience. I was very fortunate when I came to Los Angeles to have had 10 years in a large urban setting and actually had interactions with the media. The example that I gave of how I got into the position is a fairly common example across the country. And so you ask somebody who's thrust into an extremely difficult job with no background and then start talking to them about the media, I mean, they're going to panic. And I think that that's what happens generally is this kind of immediate mistrust because as a director, you probably don't have the kind of background that's going to allow you to feel comfortable talking to people who don't trust you. I mean, you know, and that's the role of the media is to not trust government officials. I mean, and I'm exaggerating just slightly, but I think it's an important role. And so I think that one of the things, and I was going to touch on it, uh, um, there was a, a, a child death in, in, in Minnesota when I was there and the child welfare director. And there was a columnist, Ruben Rosario, for the St. Paul Pioneer Press, who wrote probably the most moving story I've ever seen that, about the child protection system. And I had a chance to interact with him a lot and really saw how much he cared about the public understanding, what happens in child protection, the role of the agency, and so forth. And I think when I came to Los Angeles, I was completely open to the idea that the media has a role in this, and, and I wasn't afraid of you know, kind of that, that role. And I, but I think it's very difficult for most child welfare directors because of that issue of they're, they're thrust into the position and often don't bring a lot of years of experience. So I think opportunities like this to actually talk to people who are in the media outside of the crisis that just occurred in your jurisdiction, I think are really critical. And I think creating as many of those opportunities as possible to have those conversations is is what's necessary. It's, a, it's kind of the concrete idea for me that would, would allow for more openness. And I, you know, it's um, interesting because when we, I was part of a task force in Minnesota that opened up the juvenile court, and the survey at the time that the, um, this was being contemplated was done across the, the state to look at child welfare directors, and 80% were opposed. And similarly, <coughs> juvenile court judges, about 75% were opposed. And so there isn't kind of this believing of openness that is throughout the system. And I, and I think part of that is just lack of knowledge and lack of experience. And then my second follow-up question, which is, I guess, not a follow-up, but a different, unrelated. 
Um, what things are you looking forward to? I know that there are a few things that have at least, in a, a couple of things that have improved in terms of home visiting money um, to help prevent um, abuse and neglect, um, and then also, you know, the new health care legislation, so more <coughs> families and children will be, you know, have health insurance, so maybe some of the, the support. What things do you think are, are, are positive? I think one of the positive things we're doing in LA County, I think Dr. Sanders touched on it, was the TDMs, which is a team decision making before I'd be out there by myself. Now I can pull the whole team together and I can have a public health nurse in there and I can have county council and I can have all these people go, yeah, Jennifer, this is a good decision. It really helps because let me tell you, I've been out there at 12 midnight hearing gunshots going, oh my God, I've got to make a decision and I am going to be killed if I don't do this soon. <laughs> so um, it's great to be able to have that. So I think with the team decision making and a lot more services to families. I mean, back when I was a worker in the 90s, you know, you just didn't have all the services you have today. Now you can send the family for family preservation. You can send the family to get a lot in in home services, which means they come in and actually teach you how to clean your house and teach you how to cook and teach you how to take care of your kids. So I just think there's a lot more services today than definitely there was 15, 20 years ago. And you guys you were, were coming very close to the 7.30 hour incredibly already. So maybe we could have um, two more questions and then, and then let it and then adjourn so and yeah I have a question for Jennifer um, I would be focused on the, the girl sex to sex to abuse girl the video she does the How, one that the video the yeah, one yeah, yeah she yeah, actually I, fell in love with her father but he had we call him the father because he had raised her since she was one uh -huh. So she didn't see it as sexual abuse, and she was now pregnant, and that's how we got the call. Yes. Yeah, so how 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 would you help her to to, to get to forget such a nightmare, and how would you help her to build up her confidence tonight? And in, I also <coughs> noticed that quite now, only two percent those those uh, children will ever graduate from college. I mean, after they. Uh, removal from the, uh, their families. So well, this girl's probably going to be traumatized. She's going to have a baby, and that baby's going to be a constant reminder. Um, what we well, do is I, we offer counseling. I jumped, I mean, I'll just jump in, but I did call her up. So I did talk, oh, good. I talked to her. Oh, good. You actually went out on that Yeah, case. I talked to her, I talked to her like um, a month and a half ago. Wow. And so she's, she has a baby. Oh, she has a baby? And she's living with the man. Wow. Oh. So. so he didn't go to jail. I think he was deported. But then he, he must have hopped back over or something. Wow. Actually, so, he actually went out on that case, so he probably, wow. So I know yeah. you've had your hand up, and so has this guy, so we can, I know you've been patiently waiting. No, yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, so this will be the last one. I'm okay. sorry, guys. We've got to cut. I mean, this we can keep on going. But, yeah. um, so, just going back to that, um, you know, sort of the media's role in um, uh, providing that information, it's really important for, I mean, you know, public, uh, public service and the public needs to know and um, so I guess my question is what kind of information do you think that it's important for the general public to have about these programs in order to have an engaged and informed public like conversation and discourse going on that will um, allow people to get a sense of what good policy is and you know just um, what kind of information would you hope that the general public would have that the media could um, provide, as opposed to these kind of sensational stories that are really incomplete. So I, I probably have some um, pretty strong opinions on that. Jennifer may see it differently. I think that as um, any other system, there should be clarity on what's expected of the system and, and uh, awareness of whether the system is meeting specific goals. And so I think, as an example, I think it's really critical if a child's been abused or neglected, that the system has an absolute, and comes to the attention of the agency, the system has an absolute responsibility to assure that child isn't abused or neglected again. I mean, I think that's just kind of the, and one of the absolute fundamental responsibilities of the agency. And so, you can measure that. How many children are re-abused once they've come to the attention of the agency? And I think, is that an expectation of the public? I would say probably yes. And then I think it's the responsibility of the media to understand what some of those goals are and to be able to report them. If the system isn't achieving that, then that's one thing. But 
if, if, for example, there has been dramatic improvement in the safety for children and a child dies, I think that's very different than a system that is floundering and a child dies. I mean, and I think the coverage needs to, be, needs to consider that. I mean, clearly it's a tragedy, but I think the, rem the remedy could look very different depending on the context. And I think that's the role that the media plays, is really understanding that context and making sure the public understands it. And part of that is knowing what should be expected of the system and whether the system is meeting those expectations. Right, and if I can just add to that is, if, I think you said it best earlier, if you, we were so surprised that our, our current director invited Garrett Tarnoff, who's our infamous writer of bad stories. He said, I'm having him come to a staff meeting and everybody thought, is this man crazy? Is he nuts? Who would bring a reporter? But let me tell you, he came in, he looked a little scared, but then he was himself, and we haven't had a negative story. So I think when you, when you, I don't want to say befriend your journalist, but it's almost better to befriend him and be open and honest, and they always say, you guys don't tell us anything, so you lead us to make, you know, to sort of think on our own. If you would just sit down and talk to us and tell us what's going on, Plus, this is a great way for us to say, look at all the good things that are going on. Look at all these kids we have saved. So I think we need to be very transparent. We have to be open, and we have to sort of make them our friends. And, and for years, it's really just been an adversary. We just think media. And, and I, think, I think the question was asked, and I know when I talk to social workers, their biggest fear is that the words they say will be sort of twisted and turned. So people don't always trust, sorry, just like they don't always trust child welfare, they really don't trust journalists because they could spin it, they're telling the truth, but they spin it in sort of a different way. And I have no better example, I was in a magazine called Marie Claire and it was ordinary people with famous names. So they did uh, Jennifer Lopez, Meg Ryan, and Julia Roberts. And I sort of, so I went to the interview and then when I read it, I'm like, well, I didn't say it like, I mean, I didn't say it like that. So I read it, I said, well, I did say it, but it was amazing how they kind of, they made it seem like I, like I liked the other Jennifer Lopez. And I said, well, I really, she, I think I said she annoyed me or something. <laughs> I don't remember what I said, but it was twisted, but it was the truth. Does that make sense? So I think people have this fear with journalists because they want to make their story so good, they're going to twist and add and turn. And I think that, that that's the fear really from the other side. So if there's anything I can add to all you future journalists is to really, you know, ask us and hopefully we'll be transparent and we can report the real news. You guys have been a great audience. Thank you very much.